Good evening on this Monday, December 21st, and welcome to the Georgia Gang. All eyes on us, Democrats and Republicans pour all of their energy and money into Georgia for control of the U.S. Senate. After pressure mounts, Georgia's Secretary of State orders a statewide signature audit in the November general election. And each one of us names our Georgians of the year. Baron, Phil, Janelle, and Kathy are all here tonight. The debate and discussion begin right now. From Fox 5 Atlanta, this is a special edition of The Georgia Gang. Here's Lori Geary. Hello, everyone. The holidays are upon us. So who will walk away with the biggest gift of all? Control of the U.S. Senate. That question comes down to two runoff elections right here in Georgia that will be decided in the first week of the new year. Here's a closer look at the stakes. Right now, we know that Republicans hold 50 Senate seats in the next Congress. Democrats, along with two independents who caucus with them, hold 48. If the Democrats take both Georgia runoffs, the Senate will be evenly split between the two parties. And incoming Democratic Vice President Kamala Harris will hold the tie-breaking vote. Georgia Democrats proved in November that their ground game is strong, but history is on the side of Republicans when it comes to runoffs here. The latest Insider Advantage poll tells us what we've known all along. These races are close. Take a look. Republican Senator Kelly Loeffler has a slight lead over her Democratic challenger, Reverend Raphael Warnock. Only a small number of voters say they're undecided. In the other runoff, it's a similar story, too close to call. Senator David Perdue is up slightly over John Ossoff, but the margin of error in both of these polls is plus or minus 4%. So, Phil, let's start with you. We know that this is a turnout election. You're one of our Republicans on the panel. The message for Republicans has been don't let the radical liberals win control of the Senate. We haven't really heard a lot of talk about the issues on the GOP side. Will these messages be enough? Well, the socialism message has been very instructive to educate a lot of voters, including younger voters, that don't understand that that means command and control economy and higher taxes and big spending. But if you look at all the mailings that are flooding Georgia mailboxes, you'll see, Lori, that uh, several big issues that impact everybody's wallet are being emphasized by the Republicans. Let me give just a couple examples. Uh, the Republican Senate candidates, Purdue and Leffler, are for lowering taxes, uh, whereas the Democrats actually want to repeal the 2017 Trump tax cut, which has benefited so many people, especially small businesses. And let's take another example. When it comes to health care, you could lose your private health insurance if you have John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock as your U.S. Senators. They are completely bought into this command and control, government controlled health care, which has got a whole range of problems. And then there's the issue, especially as it hits Atlanta and our Georgia big cities, of public safety. This is the soft spot of the these liberal Democrats, they uh, have uh, viscerally don't like what's happening with the police. They're, some of them are for defunding the police, like uh, Warnock and Ossoff especially said he'd look at that issue. And I think those are issues that cut across political lines. It's not necessarily Republicans that care about those issues. It's a lot of people in the center. Well, this is why I love hosting this show, because we can do a deep dive onto these issues. Theron, I want to go over to you. I want you to talk about these issues that, that Phil brings up. But also, you know, Democrats don't have a good track record when it comes to Georgia runoffs. I mean, they're 0 for 8 in runoffs since 1992. How are Democrats trying to get their supporters back out again in these runoffs? Yeah, but we're 1-0 and o in 2020, um, <laughs> even though there's a lot of Republicans out there that don't want to accept that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are going to be the next president and vice president of the United States. Lori, you're right. I mean, it's been since 1992 that Democrats have actually elected a Democrat uh, for, for president. But I think what we have to do is that we have to start with a different premise. The premise is different this time. The enthusiasm is high. How you opened up this segment, you said that uh, we had a very strong ground game in, in Georgia, and Democrats' ground game is much stronger than the Republicans right now. And if you just look at the voting, the voting are, that is going on is strikingly similar to what we saw going into the November election. And so I feel really good about where we are right now as Democrats, but more importantly, that President-elect came here, uh, Biden came here uh, earlier last week and basically sort of is going to build upon this Biden coalition. And this Biden coalition in Georgia, Lori, wasn't just Metro 
progressive voters who voted for him. There were a lot of people in rural places that actually are watching this show right now in North Georgia and Middle Georgia and also in South Georgia. And so what we've got to do is continue to build upon these, uh, this coalition and not necessarily focus on the stuff that you just heard from my dear friend Phil. I mean, these are just scare tactics that, that, that quite frankly didn't work in November. And lastly, I'll say this, and I think a Republican friend of mine said it best this week. What Republicans need to understand is that the Trump coalition did not work in Georgia. And so the faster they can understand that, that what they try to do to win in November is not going to work again in January 5th, then they can, they, they can start accepting the election results. What Democrats have got to do is continue to motivate our base, but also appeal to a lot of these moderate Democratic voters and the disaffected Republican women and men that I believe will vote for our two Democratic U.S. Senate candidates. So Janelle, let's go over to you for another Republican perspective. And you can address Theron, but also, you know, voter, voter turnout so far is staggering, considering that these are runoff elections. About one and a half million Georgians have cast ballots, according to GeorgiaVotes.com. That's only about 7% less than this time compared to the general election. You're the honorary co-chair of the Leffler campaign. We can see that in-person voting is up compared to some absentee balloting. What's your takeaway from that? Yes, yeah, so I have several factors that as to why um, in-person voting is up. Before I address that, I think it's interesting to hear Democrats talk about how effective their ground game is. I don't know if it needs a ground game or if it's a ground game or them knocking on doors, which no one did in, during COVID, but I think it's more so because there was a referendum against the president and not just the president, but there were different media outlets, social media outlets that were censoring Republicans that are still censoring Republicans. And so if that's your idea of a ground game, then let's see how that works going forward. Because at some point, as humans beings in general, we're going to have to push back on this narrative that the only way to win elections is to spew these type of lies and disinformation that's going on. I'm pretty sure we'll get into that more in the weeds as the show continues. But the factors that I feel that are impacting the results as far as turnout right now is the fact that many Republicans are just too afraid to vote by mail because of all of the discrepancies that happened in the November election. So they're definitely voting in person, which is something we typically do anyway. Um, I also think that people feel safe voting in person because we have so many guidelines in place now that, that can protect you from the coronavirus. And let's not forget that we have a number of holidays that are coming up as well. So I think people are planning to vote ahead of the holiday. But I want to make sure I mention that majority of the people who have already voted are white females that are 65 years of age and older, which typically tend to lean, cons lean conservative. So I think this may be a good sign for Republicans as it always is during runoffs. However, I also know that we are close in this race, so we don't need to let up. All right, Kathy, over to you for a more Democratic perspective. Um, let's talk about some of the data from November. We know that thousands of voters said no to Trump, but still voted for Republicans down ballot. Does that signal trouble for Democrats, as Janelle pointed out? Well, uh, this is a horse race. And, and, you know, when you look at the polling with a four and a half percent margin of error, you know these races are still split right down the middle. So it, it is all about turnout. It's all about the ground game. And it's all about who really wants to win badly. Democrats are singularly focused on electing Ossoff and Warnock. Um, singularly focused. We don't have division. We're not split amongst ourselves about how to get it done. We are just all out there trying to win this election. Republicans are still counting votes on an election that happened a month ago. They're still, you know, split and pointing fingers and filing lawsuits that are going nowhere. And so you're going to have people who, you know, are disenchanted with what's going on, people threatening to stay home. So I feel like Democrats have the edge here. We have about 75,000 people who registered to vote between November 3rd and the cutoff uh, for this election in December. Um, I dare say a, a good portion of those will be Democrats. Democrats are, you know, at least half. So I'm feeling really good about where we are and what the numbers say. And I am incredibly optimistic about how this election is going to go. All right. Well, there's your overview for now. But now it's time to get into the weeds. Straight ahead, a closer look at the race between Senator Kelly Leffler and Raphael Warnock. She poses for a picture with a white supremacist. And some Jewish rabbis are questioning Reverend Warnock's commitment to Israel. The Georgia Gang Senate Runoff Special continues now.
We've got to win. The future of the country is on the ballot. I'm focused on making sure that we win that to hold the line here in Georgia against the radical left, the Democrat socialist policies. And that's what I'm doing every single day. We've got to rise up now in this defining moment. We cannot go to sleep. We've got to get this virus under control. We've got to distribute this vaccine safely and efficiently. We've got to strengthen the Affordable Care Act over against those who want to destroy the Affordable Care Act. A lot of issues to discuss in this race. And Kathy, I want to start with you. Let's start our discussion with voters of faith. The Reverend Raphael Warnock calls himself an activist preacher and says he's a pro-choice pastor who believes a hospital room is way too small for a woman, her doctor, and the United States government. Many of his critics say you can't be a man of the Bible and pro-choice. Kathy? Well, I think you can. I think you can listen to his words. You can listen to the words of many people of faith who understand that this is a delicate question that people need to be able to answer within the confines of, of their God and their family. And, and ultimately, uh, the woman um, who's involved needs to decide. What I think is important is that if you look back at Warnock's career. He started out as a, a teen peer counselor on reproductive health for the Georgia Department of Public Health. Um, I, you know, I think it's incredible the involvement that he's had and he really understands that we have one of the highest rate, we have the highest rate of maternal death in the country and we've got serious health care concerns uh, in this state and that he wants to put that front and center on what he cares about as a senator. Phil, Reverend Warnock, who preaches from Ebenezer Baptist Church, says it's the Republicans who are the moral hypocrites, saying they're the ones trying to take away your health care in the middle of a pandemic, and they don't fight for social justice reform. How do you respond? Well, that's absurd. In fact, in a oh, sermon uh, that came out, he was talking about uh, King Herod and how he was killing children in the Bible and then comparing that to Republicans killing people with their health care plan. I mean, that is, that's the type of radical rhetoric that we do not need. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the Republicans have their own health plan. They don't want government-controlled, expensive, tyrannical uh, health care, and they want to keep private insurance. They have their plan. And so that's just one example of, 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 of Warnock's uh, use of Christianity, trying to meld that into some sort of crypto-Marxist uh, theology. It's, I don't think it's working, and I think it's turning off a lot of independence. Janelle, Democrats were fierce in their attacks on Senator Leffler for posing in a picture earlier this month with longtime white supremacist Chester Doles, who spent decades in the KKK and the neo-Nazi National Alliance. Doles has said he has since renounced racism, but Senator Leffler's campaign said they would have kicked him out of her rally had they known. Janelle, Democrats say Senator Leffler cannot explain this photo away. Well, let me start by saying, of course, you know, Doles has since renounced racism and renounced his past, which is something that Democrats are demanding of all white people going forward. And so I don't know why it seems like only Joe Biden gets a pass when it comes to, you know, relieving yourself of your past discretions. Um, but I want to say that as a black woman, these type of articles are extremely insulting because we have reduced the word racism down to a dog whistle that now says that all black people must get in line and act as sheep when going to the slaughter whenever they hear the word racism. It's like, let's just get upset, let's get emotionally connected to it, and let's vote for the opposite because they must be less racist than the other person. The fact of the matter is everyone on this panel knows and has been around politics long enough to know that candidates take pictures with a number of people and you don't do a background check half the time before you introduce yourself to an individual and ask them questions that relate to their deep, dark past. So it's just a picture. Um, she is, has made it very clear that she does not support racism on any levels. So I don't know which, what more we need. Um, um, other than the fact that Democrats will continue to use the word racism in order to try to rally black people. Theron, you want to respond to Janelle's explanation of the photo? Yeah, I want to first start off by saying that not all Republicans are white supremacists, right? We're not going to, you know, go down that route. And as a black man, yeah, I believe that racism does exist in this country. We've seen it front and center many, many times in just in this, in this year alone. I think the problem with this photo, Lori, it's not that it's the first time, this is the second time. And so as one, as Janelle sort of said, we understand what happens, and I've been on many, many campaigns in Georgia, is that when you get attacked 
by taking a picture or having some affiliations with someone who is a former KKK member, which takes a lot of people, but particularly African Americans, down a very, very, very dark path that I know my friend Janelle does not support. That past is something that you know we as Georgians had to live through. You got to tell all of the history. But it was the second time around when her campaign not only allowed her to take a picture with this man, but it actually was published. All she had to do, Lori, was just come out and say, I denounce white supremacy, I do not support what the KKK represents or represented, and I will no longer make sure that that gentleman is involved with my campaign. That's all she had to say. But it's just this level of arrogance that exists within the Leffler campaign, which allows Democrats to continue to really push this out. And I think the media needs to talk more about why is she refusing to denounce white supremacy, and more importantly, why is she refusing to denounce the acts in this dark past as Georgians that we had to experience with the KKK? Janelle, back to you, because it's my understanding Look, she did yeah. denounce it. She did. She absolutely have. She said it numerous times that she does not support racism. She has denounced racism and white supremacy on so many different levels. It just furates me when I think that Democrats seem to find it cute or funny to continue to act as if people are, are, are acting as if they are white supremacists when in fact they have proven to not be that. We have got to stop doing this. It has completely diluted the word racism. And here, I feel like this is a signal to all white people that if you disagree with the Democratic Party, Party, you are going to be labeled this and you're going this is going to be something that's going to be stuck on you forever and ever and ever and I think we just need to stop doing this until we have absolute facts there is nothing that has happened that has proven that Senator Leffler is a part of any Nazi organization or that she's a part of the KKK so let's just stop perpetuating this narrative and continuing to to keep this false narrative going when we know it's not true okay I want to move on because Senator Leffler here's the difference okay, Lori. real quick Laura, here's the difference. When she went out and attacked Black Lives Matter, which Janelle noted she did, she came out and she attacked she did Black not Lives attack Matter. A movement. Yes, she that did. Is she, not she, true. she said that it was. Let it was finish. She, she came attacked. out. And, <laughs> she came out and I'll spoke. Okay, you okay after she didn't attack. She spoke against BLM. Okay, did she not speak against BLM? Is that not true? She spoke. She spoke against the movement's agenda, not against okay. the cause. Okay. So she's made that very clear. And Black so, lives, of course, matter, but we're not going to support organizations that want to rip fathers out of the homes. Okay, I mean, that's Theron. not what we're going to support. Let Theron finish, and then I got to move on. The, 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 the challenge is, which my colleague did acknowledge, that she did speak out against BLM after a. Uh, her ownership in a WNBA team, players, but majority of these are black women who supports this movement. And when they asked her to explain and to apologize and to change her stance, she didn't. So had she not done that, Janelle, I think the pictures with the KKK member, which, you know, no Democrats took that picture. No one told her in the Democratic Party to go out and take that picture. All right. So don't blame that on Democrats that she decided for a second time no to be pictured with that. a white supremacist. Who has done that? Yeah. So you can't blame that on Democrats. But I think ultimately, <laughs> It's what she refused to do during the comments about okay. BLM, which gave Democrats an opportunity right. to continue to push to forward to okay. the white supremacy's picture. I'm going to move on, take it from <laughs> yeah. there. Senator Leffler's campaign has been using some of Reverend Warnock's own words from his sermons against him. He says they are taken out of context. Two prominent Orthodox rabbis from Georgia have criticized Reverend Warnock for some of his comments about Israel, including a 2018 sermon during which he said the Israeli military shot unarmed Palestinian sisters and brothers like birds of prey. A clip of that is used in one of the ads against the pastor. Warnock says he supports Israel. Phil, you know, with the pandemic and the economy, we really haven't heard much about the Middle East. How big is this issue? The Mideast is a big issue, and uh, since we have a big Jewish community in Georgia, and yes, we have uh, uh, Arab communities scattered around the state, I think it uh, is a valid issue. Uh, I would have to uh, shake my head at Theron, who's all upset about a, a picture of somebody that uh, perhaps Senator Leffler doesn't know about. Why doesn't uh, Raphael Warnock condemn Louis Farrakhan? He's been, uh, that's the, uh, the leader of the Nation of Islam, a very radical, anti-white, anti-Semitic group. Uh, I want Warnock to, to condemn Louis Farrakhan. He has not done that. So, you know, Theron's worried about um, supposed Klan people. Uh, that's not a big issue. But, but anti-Semitism and, and, frankly, 
supporting someone who's anti-white should be a big issue. So I'm glad some of these sermons are coming out. It's educating people, especially in the middle of the political spectrum, who are, are I hear, shocked at some of these sermons. Well, I think that these are all big issues, and that's why we're discussing them. And Kathy, when you hear Reverend Warnock's words there, how can those in the Jewish community stand convinced that Reverend Warnock supports Israel? Well, I, when I knew we were going to do this question today, I called a number of my friends who are Jewish just to see how they were feeling about the topic. And I can tell you that uh, in my world, all of my friends were firmly in the Warnock camp and felt quite comfortable with his position on Israel and support for a two-state solution. Um, I think what's interesting is that here in Georgia, we've had a really strong black and Jewish coalition for decades now. And I think that the campaign tactic that we see at play here is trying to drive some kind of wedge into that, and I don't think it's working. Um, I will also say that I think people, you know, really want to hear, uh, you know, sort of more about specific issues. And when Phil says that Republicans have a health care policy, for example, they don't. There simply isn't one. Uh, and those are the kinds of details that people want to hear, not wrong. just the dog whistles that we've been arguing about. All right, 20 seconds, Phil, and then we'll move on. Hey, Kathy, do your Jewish friends like the alliance between Raphael Warnock and Louis Farrakhan, the anti-Semite? Do they like that? I, I haven't seen any evidence of the alliance between Warnock and <laughs> Farrakhan, so I can't answer the question. War Warnock praises him in his sermons. Warnock praises him in his sermons. And, you know, the main plank of the Republicans on health care is no tyrannical, expensive government health care and keep your private insurance. That's a heck of a good plan. Okay, we'll leave it there, everybody, because we that's have not, lots more to discuss policy. coming that's, up. That's a closer Senate look at Senate race number one. It's Republican incumbent David Perdue versus his challenger, John Ossoff, where some of the accusations involve Purdue's stock trades and Ossoff's ties to the Chinese government. Have a question or comment for the Georgia Gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. If you look at what history has told us, socialism, the price of socialism is freedom. And what's at stake here right now is the Democrats want to perpetrate a socialist agenda on our country. We know that. And what we're doing right now in Georgia with these two seats is holding the line. If we win Georgia, we save America, right? Georgia sent Donald Trump packing. And now we're feeling hope in our hearts because for the first time in four years, we have the opportunity to define the next chapter in American history. And it's Georgia that has the power. It's Georgia voters who have the power to write the next chapter in American history. And Georgia voters are standing up for health, jobs, and justice for the people. Lots of accusations flying between these two, the powerful Republican incumbent, Senator David Perdue, and his Democratic challenger, John Ossoff. Theron, I want to start with you. Some say it didn't really hurt Senator Perdue to skip the one and only runoff debate a couple of weeks ago. What are your thoughts? You know, I, I think that Senator Perdue actually is a good debater. I mean, Laura, he's shown us over his six years of being a U.S. Senator that he's actually, you know, a very good orator. He can actually articulate his positions on issues. But unfortunately, his decision not to debate John Ossoff just baffles me because what he's allowed John Ossoff to do is to continue to say in his rallies, like, where's David Perdue? You know, I want to know what David Perdue stands on these issues, but we don't know because he won't debate John Ossoff. And and I think the difference is also is that while the TV commercials are just what they are, I mean, from the Purdue campaign, I think the Georgia voters deserve to hear these two men talk about their differences on the policies and who is the best person to serve this new sort of blue Georgia that we live in. And so I think it definitely is hurting him. But ultimately, I think that John Ossoff has got to continue to figure out ways to get his message out to the people. He's doing a really good job with his com commercials, where I think are brilliant. But I just think that ultimately Purdue not um, uh, deciding to debate him is just a mistake. Phil, do you think it was a mistake? No, it wasn't a mistake. Uh, 
actually there were two debates already between David Perdue and John Ossoff, and enough's enough. Uh, Ossoff wanted five. That's ridiculous. Laurie, you had said at the outset that it's a turnout election. Well, yes, it is. Both sides are beating the bushes to get every one of their folks out and to try and convince people in the middle. That's what Senator Perdue is, is focused on. He's going all over the state, and, and that's where he should be spending his time, especially in the suburbs, to shore up some of the vote that uh, the, uh, the Republicans may have hemorrhaged uh, on, on November 3rd. So, uh, and again, the contrast is very great. It's, it's economic freedom versus socialism, which is the erosion of freedom. And I think a lot of people, especially younger voters, are still trying to figure out, what do you mean by socialism? Well, this is what is, it, it's a great civics lesson for the electorate, is to see these two go at it with these two contrasting ideologies. All right, I want to get into the issues in this race, the more in-depth issues. Let's talk about Senator Perdue's stock trades. John Ossoff has tried to hammer Senator Perdue on this issue, saying Senator Perdue sold off stocks at the beginning of the pandemic because he had inside information and that Senator Perdue was looking out for himself and not voters. Ossoff even called Senator Perdue a crook. Senator Perdue has fired back, saying the Department of Justice, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the Senate Ethics Committee have all cleared him. Kathy, former Senator Saxby Chambliss, a Republican, says this is just not an issue and that people are more worried about the economy. What do you say? Well, I think it is an issue, and I think it's the reason that Purdue won't be in any face-to-face -face debates. He doesn't want to get called out on the issue. We all know the Senate Ethics Committee has never convicted anybody of anything, so having politicians, uh, you know, judge their peers is just not the way to to do an investigation. And and this yelling about socialism, you know, Phil just said the young people don't even know what socialism is. Exactly. This is not part of anything Democrats ever talk about in my entire career. I've never heard it as a topic of discussion, but we know that it doesn't poll well, and so there's just more dog whistles. I want to hear some really hardcore conversation among our Senate candidates about, you know, specifically what are we going to do to provide health insurance for the almost million Georgians that don't have health care, how we're going to distribute a vaccine, how we're going to get our business uh, community back on its feet again. And we're just not hearing those details. We're just hearing dog whistles. Well, just Janelle, do you think Democrats are spending too much time on these accusations surrounding the stock trades? I absolutely think they are sending, spending way too much time on it, mainly for the fact that Senator Perdue wasn't in the room when the discussion was had. So before he wasn't a part of it, and now he is. And that's only because Senator Perdue's record is solid. And for Ossoff, all he has is to try to attack him on some fake stock trades that he thinks he has something on. And then as well as, you know, utilizing the pandemic, which surprised us all. I have to disagree a little bit, though, with Kathy and, and Phil when it comes to whether young people are paying attention to know what socialism is. And the truth is, they may not have the, the direct information, but one thing I do know is that they are aware of that, thanks to AOC. I know a lot of young people that are claiming to be socialists. I've had a family member tell me that he was a socialist now. So I do think that there is a notion, or, or it's just an ideology that's coming out of the left on the progressive side that is pushing for socialism, Marxism, and those agendas. Um, but I do think this speaks volume to, you know, Senator Purdue like I said, his record that John Ossoff is attacking him on something that's so false. Well, Theron Senator Purdue is painting John Ossoff as someone with deep ties to the Chinese government because his investigative film company received money for distribution. Is this a fair accusation? Well, listen, you know, when you're involved in a campaign, I mean, you know, both candidates will throw things out there. I mean, listen, John Ossoff is not letting up on the fact that he believes that there was, you know, some funny business in definitely some questions there around the stock trading. But this, this attack on John Ossoff and his affiliation with China has been totally, totally, um, you know, come up to be totally false by another news outlet. They did a thorough investigation. They came back and said this was just a total false claim. And the Ossoff campaign has talked about how their, you know, his work with um, in, uh, interviewing people, pushing back on corruption, doing documentaries on uh, different things that are going around the world. And so while, you know, it's fair for the Senator Purdue to make that claim, I think the only difference is, is that you got to back it up with evidence, and especially when it's been thoroughly vetted uh, to be false. But ultimately, I just want to say this. I think the difference between John Ossoff and David Perdue is that John Ossoff is talking about the future. He's talking about health care. He's talking about getting people back to work. 
He's talking about making sure that we deal with this deadly pandemic, Lori, that is still killing people right now in Georgia. And I think that that's going to be the difference. And then, look, he also is talking about bringing people together. And I think that his message is a bipartisan message, which he needs. Again, I'm going to keep saying this. We need moderate voters and some independent, disaffected Republicans to vote for both candidates in order for us to be victorious on January 5th. Phil, go ahead and respond to Theron. But also, we learned that President Donald Trump will be back in Georgia on the eve of election day. And I want to ask you, do, Phil, does this hurt or help Republicans? Well, I'll address the, um, the Trump rally in a minute, but I have to laugh. Theron forgot to tell the viewers a couple things, and that is back in May, just before the Democratic primary, John Ossoff hid the fact that he received all this money for his media company from the Chinese Communist government. And uh, he said it was a mistake and oversight. Well, come on, that's a, what a joke that is. He needs to condemn. If, if you want to convince us, uh, Mr. Ossoff, condemn the Communist Chinese government for their infiltration in America, if for their hu horrible human rights uh, uh, record, uh, the crushing of independence in Hong Kong. You know, I would remind Theron and that uh, Democrat and Republican foreign policy experts by a big majority say that communist China is a huge threat to this country and this country's economy and security. And I think even Joe Biden has to be very careful when, with, his, with all of this controversy now about China. So Ossoff better renounce China and any ties. All right, real quick, Phil, Phil does he help or hurt? Does President Trump help or hurt Republicans? <laughs> Well, obviously, uh, all Republicans want all the Trumpers to come out uh, just like they did November 3rd. And the party is a coalition, and so that's going to always help. I, I don't see any downside to Trump coming in here and rallying the troops. All right. Thank you. Coming up, everyone, we'll talk about the split in the Republican Party and how it could impact the Senate runoffs. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger has announced a statewide signature audit in the general election. He started out with Cobb County. And Kathy, I want to ask you, even if questionable signatures are found on envelopes, it's not like you can match signatures with ballots because they are separated once they are verified. So Raffensperger says this won't do anything to change the outcome. Kathy, I want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I don't understand why he's doing it. You know, when when uh, Raffensperger doesn't kowtow to uh, th these demands, he, he starts to look like a secretary of state for all Georgians, somebody who's really trying to lead his way through uh, a real mess in his party. Um, but then when he kind of folds and, and goes down these rabbit holes, uh, like these audits, I think it really is problematic. And I, I have to think that in the 159 counties in Georgia, election workers, election boards are really, really tired. They're trying to do an election that's going to have unprecedented turnout on January 5th, and they just don't need another useless demonstration for some folks who uh, really have made no credible uh, allegations uh, to date. Well, you know, we have seen quite a split within the Republican Party when it comes to support for the Secretary of State. Senators Leffler and Purdue have called for his resignation. Both Raffensperger and members of his staff, including Gabriel Sterling, who is the implementation manager, have received death threats. Sterling, who's a Republican himself, addressed those threats during an emotional news conference in which he criticized President Trump and Georgia's Republican senators. Mr. President, you have not condemned these actions or this language. Senators, you have not condemned this language or these actions. This has to stop. We need you to step up, and if you're going to take a position of leadership, show some. Phil, Secretary Raffensperger, a Republican who says he supports President Trump and voted for him, has said Senators Leffler and Purdue need to focus on their Senate runoffs rather than going after him. Well, naturally, he doesn't want to be the target of especially what happened last March 
uh, that was he to blame. Uh, he, uh, this, the legal settlement, settlement that he did with Stacey Abrams and other Democratic entities are the genesis of all of these problems and the fraud allegations and why we have investigations. And I have to laugh at Kathy. She wanted investigation after investigation two years ago when it came to Stacey Abrams, and now we're not supposed to address anything. That, that doesn't fly at all. But when it comes to, to uh, Gabe Sterling, who's my friend, uh, he lives in Sandy Springs where I do, um, I, I think that uh, all Republicans of, of good faith, including all Democrats of good faith, would condemn violence. Uh, I think that was a red herring to, to take away from the fact that we had uh, uh, what a million point two of these uh, absentee ballot applications flooding around and you have to have audits and an audit will look at the good pile and the bad pile and the supposedly good pile we need to audit to see if there's some bad things in there it's very basic Theron, you know this whole split in the Republican Party do you, is this just music to Democrats ears well, I got to, you know, back up my good friend Kathy, who early on said that, you know, Democrats are united. I mean, we're just not having these type of crazy, you know, sort of events. I mean, it's a circus right now within the GOP in Georgia. I mean, Joe Biden won this state three times, Lori, three times. And it was because you had a lot of people who did not want to accept the outcome of the election. And so for Senator, Secretary of State Raffensperger to be getting attacked, who's come out and said, look, he's a Republican. He voted for Donald Trump, uh, but he's got to follow the law. And what's interesting to me is that I remember a time in Georgia where Republicans would all be about following the law, making sure that people do right by the, the voters of Georgia. But to encourage the governor, by the way, who got a lot of criticism as well from President Trump, to break the law and to do the one thing that we all want to try to make sure that this state continue, that doesn't continue to get a bad reputation that is around voter suppression. And so I think there's a proxy war going on right now within the Republican Party and every single Republican elected has got to figure out what does life look like after Donald Trump. And so while these Trump- Theron, nobody, are nobody there, said, nobody said vote, break the law. It, Nobody he said break the law. That's it. When, That's when, when, you, when you're encouraging device. him We're not to do fraud. what they're doing. We're looking for fraud. No, 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 no. Go ahead, Darren. When, when, when well, you're your not president finding it. has said what he said, yeah, you're not fine. And that's exactly. You're actually, you, you come out the investigation after investigation. I mean, let's talk about this, Phil. This Texas lawsuit, and you're not praising Chris Carr. You should be praising Chris Carr. He's a Republican attorney general. But you won't do it. Why? Because you're scared of the Trump supporters I'll, and everything that Trump represents. But a Supreme no, Court. No, no one's scared of anything. We, through, we, through want, we want, want to deal actually. with no fraud. Let Phil, let Phil respond to Theron. Why don't, why don't we talk about the Georgia lawsuit that attorney Ray Smith is doing where you had 1,700 double votes? Are you in favor of that? I mean, I, it sounds like the Democrats well, feel that, they, oh, there's nothing well, to see here. There's no fraud. You've got people voting from out of state. That has been documented through affidavits. I, I, I don't understand. Two weeks ago Ray Wood, Kathy, now it's Ray. You're intellectually honest. You know, don't you uh, want to fight fraud? fraud? Look. 20 seconds Listen, there. I do, it's but once like again, Kathy, we've been, we've been like talking Kathy about said. this for weeks. We've been, we've been talking about this for weeks. Ch allegation after allegation, none of them have been based, have, have found anything true about this well, allegation. that's why you investigate. So I just don't know where that's else you go. That's why you go. investigate. That's not well, true. Well, you just can't keep investigating. I, I love you can't Democrat come up with that. anything. Okay, you know viewers don't like it when y'all talk over yeah. each other, so I'm going to move on. Uh, I don't understand the strategy of some Republicans who are telling fellow GP, GOP voters to stay home because President Trump was cheated out of a win. One of those is high profile attorney Lynn Wood. Listen. We're not going to sell our votes to China. We're not going to vote on the damn machines made in China. We're going to vote on machines made in the USA. Then we had the president's retweet this from Lynn Wood, quote, President Trump is a genuinely good man. He does not really like to fire people. I bet he dislikes putting people in jail, especially Republicans. He gave Brian Kemp and the Secretary of State every chance to get it right. They refused. They will soon be going to jail. Janelle, as a conservative Republican, what are your thoughts here? 
Well, for one, we're talking about two different things. So what Lynn Wood was saying in that rally is something totally opposite to the from the retweet that President Trump, the tweet that President Trump retweeted, which was basically talking about the election process in general. But President Trump has made it very clear that everyone needs to go out and vote. I don't think this is as big of an issue within the Republican Party as the media wants it to be. But unlike the Democrats, who have the luxury of hiding all of their infighting because of the fact that no one wants to report on it, although there are a lot of progressives that are being slighted. I know BLM and the Black Lives Matter movement that Theron loves to support is also upset with the Biden administration because they won't meet with them. As well as there are progressives who are right now trying to force Pelosi's hand to vote on a Medicare for all in the House, which they're ignoring them too. So this is the thing. At the end of the day, there is a division that's happening amongst ideologies, not so much parties, just different ideologies in general. And when it comes down to whether, whether you're a Trumplican, which are the people that I feel that came in during 2016 or you're Republican, we need each and every one to win elections. And, say, and, and President Trump knows he needs both Republican Senates in office in order to continue to push forth his efforts. Kathy, how are Democrats capitalizing on this or are they just letting Republicans battle it out? Well, I think to some degree they're just letting Republicans battle it out. They're doing their own damage. We just need Lynn Wood to convince one percent of Republicans to stay home, and and then we'll uh, win this election. Uh, I think we're going to win it in a different kind of way. But to the extent that those deep divisions happen, um, I think it's good for for Democrats, and we don't need to be, you know, trying to jump all over what seems to be a pretty uh, effective, divisive message. Well, one person not taking well, any of these accusations lightly is Governor Brian Kemp, especially when it comes to his family. Kemp specifically addressed recent online conspiracy theories that the deaths of a GBI agent and Harrison Deal, who was dating one of Kemp's daughters, were somehow tied to the election. People need to deal with facts, and we'll give them to them. And if anybody has an issue with something I've done, they need to come see me, and I'll talk to them about it. They don't need to bother my wife or my children or anybody, any other person that's serving an elective office, their wife or children. Because I can assure you, I can handle myself, and they're, if they're brave enough to come out from underneath that keyboard or behind it, we can have a little conversation if they would like to. Phil, the fact that Governor Kemp even had to go there really says a lot about where we are. We see some crazy claims from both the far right and the left. But what do you think is really happening here in the Republican Party of Georgia? Well, I think you just underscored it a second ago by saying there's crazy claims from the right and the left. And social media, of course, just exaggerates all of this and, and promotes it and amplifies it. So uh, the governor had every right uh, to speak out, especially since uh, one of his daughters was involved. And so and I, I think candidates of whatever political stripe should speak out every now and then. Uh, social media is a very corrosive thing. Uh, you've got to be very careful. Voters especially need to do their homework and check on information. Uh, you can't just count on what they used to call the mainstream media. I call it the corporate media now. In fact, um, a lot of uh, folks on the left are joining some of us on the right in calling out the corporate media for just promoting misinformation, slander. Uh, I think this we could have a whole show for an hour on the state of journalism, too. Well, Theron and then Phil, or actually Theron and then Janelle, I want to ask you this real quickly. Win or lose, will Democrats accept the results of the election? And then right over to Janelle, will Republicans accept the results of the election? Theron first. <laughs> Uh, I, w I want to say this real quick about uh, Governor Kemp. I think he was right to really call out these folks, and Janelle will agree with me. Marty Kemp doesn't need anyone to defend her. She's just as fiery <laughs> as the governor. Definitely his four daughters are definitely uh, able to speak out for themselves um, as well. But, yeah, look, we will accept the election results if they're fair and they're proper and it's secure. And if make sure that you know there are no irregularities and no fraud. If that all that happens, then yes. But I think we're going to win. But ultimately, I do think no matter who wins, there's going to be a lot of conversations afterwards because of all this all right. sort of what we see the Republicans are doing for this election. Quickly, Janelle, win or lose, will Republicans accept <laughs> yeah, well, the results? Yeah, I mean, Theron's. Yeah, well, it's funny because Theron actually sound like Republicans, you know. Yeah, we would absolutely accept the result as long as it's fair and there's no fraud and that we don't have to question the integrity of the election. We would absolutely accept it. So thank you, Theron, for answering that. Long January, for me. everybody. <laughs> Hang in there. Coming up, the gang names their Georgians of the Year. Stay with us. The Georgia Gang Senate Runoff Special continues now.
We usually end our show with winners and losers for the week, but because it's been a tumultuous 2020, we thought we would end with our Georgians of the year. So we're gonna run the table and Kathy, we'll start with you. Thanks, happy holidays everybody, and I hope you stay safe and uh, manage to get in some family time at the same time. My Georgians of the year are, are Stacey Abrams. She's done an incredible job of trying to keep voting safe for everyone, both here and uh, around the country. And it's I'm just so proud that she's uh, from here and that um, she's doing the work she's doing. Nikema Williams is my other Georgian of the year. She's our newest member of Congress from the 5th District. Uh, she's chair of the Democratic Party of Georgia. She's president of the freshman class of members of Congress, and she just got appointed with Carolyn Bordeaux to the Infrastructure and Transportation Committee. Looking forward to great things and just so proud to be her friend. Awesome, great. Phil, over to you. Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. And you'd have to say that the four Georgians of the year have got to be your four U.S. Senate candidates that we've been talking about on the show. David Perdue, Kelly Leffler, Raphael Warnock, and John Ossoff. But I also want to recognize other Georgians of the year. These are unsung heroes. There are three U.S. attorneys in Georgia that are prosecuting criminals, B.J. Pack and uh, Charlie Peeler over in Macon and uh, Bobby Christine over in Savannah. They've been doing a great job. And you know, Laura, I'm going to break the rules. I'm going to make a loser. He is a Georgian of the year because everybody's talking about him, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. Uh, he's being bashed by the left and the right, and uh, the only thing I can see in his future is that uh, he, he may be a one-termer and uh, maybe switching to the Democratic Party. Phil, you love to break the rules. You snuck that one in on us. <laughs> Theron, over to you, and we should mention that Phil did name two Democrats as Georgians of the Year, so over to you. Well, again, happy holidays to everyone, and please continue to wear a mask and, and be safe. Um, our first Georgian of the year has definitely got to be Congressman John Lewis. Unfortunately, we lost him this year. Uh, second Georgian of the year is going to be Reverend Joseph E. Lowry. We lost him this year as well. And also uh, Reverend C.T. Vivian. Uh, they are all Georgians of the year who are pillars in the civil rights community, so I have to make sure I recognize them. And then lastly, Lori, I wanted to definitely start with our frontline workers. So many of these men and women put their lives on the line during this deadly pandemic to protect us. Also, our essential government workers, people who did not stop picking up our trash, making sure that our streets were clean, making sure that we were safe, our APD officers, and all the uh, um, police officers around the state of Georgia. And then lastly, our poll workers. Our poll workers did a great job this year. Through all the chaos, through all the claims of voting fraud, I want to thank you all so much for showing up and counting all those votes three times to elect Joe Biden as the uh, next president of the United States. So thank you. All right. Thanks for mentioning everybody there. And Janelle, over to you. We have about two minutes. Yeah, so um, I think my, my colleagues have pretty much covered everything. So I'm going to come from a different angle. And my Georgians of the Year comes from the grassroots community. I did some digging and talked to both the Leffler and the Purdue campaign and just kind of get some ideas of who has been really, really influential in helping them. I mean, these are the people who don't get a lot of accolades. They knock on doors. They, they fill out postcards and do all the stuff that no one knows is happening, but you definitely see the wind. So my uh, first uh, Georgian of the Year is Carly Henson from Buckhead. Thank you for all that you do, all the doors that you've hit, and just your commitment to the Leffler and Purdue campaign. And lastly, Frankie Ross from Houston County. Thank you for galvanizing Middle Georgia and all that you do to help the Republican senators as well. So congratulations to you both and to all of the volunteers out there who are working so very hard to make sure that these elections go off without a hitch and that our, our uh, senators bring home a win. All right, it is a lot of work and it has yet to end. I think our new year starts on January 6th, we hope, right? Yes. <laughs> My Georgians of the Year, <laughs> Theron kind of stole from me, but that's okay because it's worth mentioning again, our healthcare heroes and all the frontline workers who are still helping us to fight this pandemic. Also the teachers and administrators who have spent time in person and virtually thank you for helping our kids. And thanks so much for all of you for watching this special primetime edition of the Georgia Gang. We invite you to join us this and every Sunday Sunday morning at 8.30 for more debate and discussion as the gang talks Georgia politics right here on Fox 5. Have a great night, everyone. The opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the panelists appearing in this program.